Welcome to another episode of Pinsky Law Presents. And today we're going to talk about the basics of creating a fire service training program. Now, as a resource, you can consult the Lawn Management Resource Manual, pages 654 to 688. You can order this book from www.pinskylaw.com. So let's be clear. Federal law does require firefighter training. Volume 29 of the Code of Federal Regulations, section 1910.156, does contain standards for training in the fire service. This standard actually requires certain types of training for all firefighters. Now, the standards give some general guidance as to the frequency of training and some very specific instruction on limited types of issues. So, 1910.156 comes from the Fire Brigade standard, and the standard states that the fire department must assure that training and education is conducted, conducted frequently enough to assure that each member of the department is able to perform the member's assigned duties and to function satisfactorily and in a safe manner so as not to endanger firefighters. Now that phrase isn't so simple. Each member of the department must be able to perform the member's assigned duties in a satisfactory and safe manner so as not to endanger firefighters. And the standard requires that all members have to be provided with training at least annually, though let's be fair, that's not a goal. Members who are expected to perform interior structure, structural firefighting have to receive training at least quarterly. And again, as a 30-year firefighter, I would say quarterly is not what we should be shooting for. Now, we offer a two to four hour program to talk about and assist you at designing and implementing a full formal firefighter training program. Obviously, in P Pinsky Law Presents, we're just gonna be talking for a couple of minutes about the overall steps. But generally speaking, the steps are one, identify the services that the department's going to perform. Example, interior firefighting, auto extrication, rope rescue. You can't know the skills you need until you know the services that everyone is expected to perform. Step two is we're going to identify the essential skills needed to perform each service. We'll talk about that today. Step three, we have to identify the risks of each service. And we have to determine whether the training that we're going to offer is going to limit the risks that could be encountered. This is actually required both by federal law and NFPA 1500. Then we want to identify the policies and procedures which are going to govern each practice. We want to create a lesson plan to teach each essential skill. And we want to perform at least quarterly evaluations of the essential skills which a member must perform. So again, today we're just going to talk about a couple of the steps. So jumping now to step two, risk identification. NFPA 1500 requires that the department create a risk management plan. Now, yes, it's true. NFPA 1500 is not law, but we strongly suggest that you perform a risk management plan and that will lead you to the determination of what skills are going to be needed and what training must be offered so that we can lower the risks we identify as part of the risk management plan. So the risks we're going to look at coming up in the next slide are going to be used to determine what our training program needs to show. I'm going to give you an example. So let's look at a basic risk management uh, assessment of interior firefighting. On a scale of like one being the lowest and five being the highest, and this is what we've created and we give you a pretty decent sample of it in the book, wouldn't you say that suffering burns, smoke inhalation, suffocation is a pretty high risk of being an interior firefighter? That's a five. Jumping down, maybe drowning is a two. Violence from persons could be a three. Today, it could be a five. Injuries from falling objects, a five. So you'll perform this assessment, and you'll come up with all the risks, and then you'll look at how do we prevent the risks. So just jumping to this for a second, how would you prevent the risk of regulator failure? Well, you'd have maintenance programs, certainly, and you would also teach people what to do if the regulator or part of the SCBA fails. So jumping to step three, skills identification. You've now, in step two, identified the risks to certain parts of uh, functions, certain functions you're going to perform as an interior firefighter or as an operator or fire police, any other role in the department. Well, NFPA 5.1.2 says 
The fire department shall provide training and education for all department members commensurate with the duties and functions that they're expected to perform. Well, you got to know what skills you need to perform the services you're going to give. The fire department shall establish training and education programs that provide new members with initial training, proficiency opportunities, and a method of skill and knowledge evaluation for duties assigned to the member prior to engaging in emergency operations. Now this is significant because you not only have to establish the training program for new members and proficiency opportunities to get better, but you have to come up with a way to evaluate their skills and knowledge. Let's be fair, the only way you could do that is not at a drill. The only way you could do that is a formal evaluation. Think of the basic firefighter, fire department drill today. You hold a drill, you let everyone know we're gonna do it on a Tuesday. Some people show up, some people don't. Some of those who show up participate, some don't. And yet, you really didn't care necessarily whether they completed the drill. And at the end of the year, we look at their hours and say, yeah, everyone here got 50 hours or 70 hours. But we don't actually know that the people could throw a ladder that they could vent a roof, that they could perform a search or pull a hose line like we want them to do to come to our standard. Because if I'm uncomfortable being on a roof, I'm just not going to come to the roof ventilation drill. I'll still get my hours a different way. And when I'm doing classroom training, how are we evaluating whether I've actually got the knowledge necessary? That's the point of this section 5.1.3. You have to have a way to evaluate the skills and knowledge of everybody. And you're going to find out in a minute how important that is. Now 5.1.4 says the fire department shall restrict the use of new members during emergency operations until the member has demonstrated the skills and abilities to complete the tasks expected. Now in New York State, you don't have to take firefighter one, though most of us think you do, but shouldn't you? because there's a formal method of determining whether the firefighter has completed the skill sheets to a state standard. That would satisfy that requirement. 5.3.4, the fire department shall provide an annual skills check to verify minimum professional qualifications. This is what I am suggesting. Take the state sheets or create your own skill sheets and test members in every essential function. Test them in groups of two so that they're not all watching to remind themselves how to do it, that they're actually being tested on what they know. And look, this isn't punitive. This isn't for embarrassment purposes. If they're not good at it, great. We've found something we can work with them on. And then you'll take maybe minutes, maybe an hour or two, and get them to the minimum level necessary. Because that minimum level necessary is not only going to protect them, it's going to help them save and serve the public. Now, 5.3.5, the fire department shall provide training and education right, as um, required to support the minimum requirements. So you're not only going to test the skills, but you're going to offer the drills. As we've said, do the skill or do the drill. But you've got to do one of them. You've got to perform the actual hands-on requirement. 5.3.6, members shall practice assigned skill sets on a regular basis, but never less than annually. Well, that means you need to identify the minimum skills necessary and make sure that everybody is checked off at having actually performed them. And that can either be in the drill, where they're observed and signed off as having done it in the drill after they were taught how to do it, or it could be annually to a skill. Let me give you an example. I've been throwing ladders for, I don't know, a couple of decades now. I don't really need to sit through, I hope, a two and a half hour ladder drill. But if I can come on a Saturday or a weekday and take 20 minutes and show you that I can throw a 24-foot ladder and I can bring an 18-foot to the roof or I can help throw a 32-foot ladder and I do it proficiently and safely to the standards in the skill sheet, isn't that enough? I don't need to sit through the two-and-a-half-hour drill. And the other benefit is now those who do need that, the newer members, they get more focused attention in a smaller group from the instructor where we're not having people stand around and get lost at the drill. 5.3.7, the fire department shall provide specific training to members with written policies, practices, procedures, and guidelines, and that they remain current and updated. That's what we need. It's a standard we evaluate everyone to. Now step three, skills identification. 
we have to identify the skills needed to be a firefighter, to be a fire police. So that could be donning and doffing SCBA, doing SCBA breathe downs, calling a mayday, bailing out a window, making a hydrant, stretching a hose line, pulling a two and a half, whatever it is, you determine it. There's no requirement as to what has to be in that standard as long as you identify in your department what skills are needed. In my department, we know we need to know how to set up for a tanker draft and set up hard suction. Maybe in the city you don't need that skill. So we'll have different standards. You create the standards and then you're going to test on them. Well, that's everything for today. That's a very little bit of a big lecture, but it helps you get underway at developing a true fire service training program. If you need any more assistance, please consult the Fire Department Lawn Management Resource Manual, where we've got 30 to 40 pages of training suggestions and standards and help to really help you get to that perfect training standard that you want for your department and, frankly, to help your public. I'll see you next time on Pinsky.